How's everybody doing today? Everybody make it to the concert last night? Yeah. I appreciate you still making it in. I was glad it was an 11.30 session and not like 8 a.m. in DevNet because I'm not sure I'd have made it in for an 8 a.m. session this morning. Have we enjoyed Cisco Live? Have we enjoyed the DevNet area? Is this anybody's first DevNet session so far this week? No? All right. That's good. I like the fact that Cisco's invested so much time in this type of an area to give us the opportunity to look at Cisco technology in a different way. We're so traditionally used to leveraging Cisco CLI, the basic web interfaces for how we work with our infrastructure, but the fact of the matter is, that's not good enough anymore. We have to have the ability to use APIs, and Cisco's offering a full range of APIs across our platforms. We're gonna talk about UCS Director's REST-based API and how we can leverage that to drive Cisco One Enterprise Cloud Suite from different mechanisms, whether we're doing it on our own or we're giving the APIs to our developers that are actually trying to build applications on top of the Enterprise Cloud Suite platform. My remote has died on me. Let's see. We're gonna cover really briefly, I've got two slides on just level setting API essentials. So what do we mean by an API? What is the REST format used for? And then we're gonna dive directly into using the REST API in UCS Director to order and consume services. So what we have here um, is a pro tip. As I mentioned, it's the interface lock-in. The fact that there's only one way to use a piece of technology is no longer good enough. And APIs are how we can string these together so that we have better capabilities to take advantage of stringing orchestration tools together putting it in the hands of our developers so they can use infrastructure as code and they can process our practice DevOps operations. And learn Python. If you've been in the DevNet area, we've had whole classes around the Python language and it's a great technology, it's a great format to help traditional IT folks that may not be familiar and have a background in programming to get started so that they can have that capability. It doesn't take a lot of upfront effort to get started. So APIs, when I work with my customers and I talk about APIs, everybody kind of gets a little glassy-eyed sometimes because they're not exactly sure what an API means because it's this terminology that started to come out over the last few years. But frankly, an API is just any way that we work with an application or a service. We've been using APIs for everything that we've done with Cisco all along. The CLI is an API. Web-based interfaces are APIs. SNMP is an API. It's just a matter of how are we gonna interface with our applications and our services to consume them. And what we're finding is that REST is becoming the API that is driving the cloud. Any traditional, any, any cloud-based service, any cloud application that comes out today is being built with these REST APIs so that we can use them and abuse all of these services however we want to go forward on those. When we talk about REST, REST as an API uses HTTP as a carrier protocol. The carrier protocol in our traditional mechanism for CLI access on a Nexus switch or a Catalyst switch or an iOS is Telnet or SSH. It's just that's the technology that allows us to interface in and run the commands that we're after. When we're working with REST, the carrier protocol is HTTP, the same protocol that's used to drive the internet so that we can do Google searches and we can check our Facebook status and you can hit the Twitter pages and get the news services. What, what has been done with REST is that we take that same format, that same RFC, and we just package up the commands inside of that HTTP request. And we use the methods that were already inherent in HTTP to drive what we're trying to accomplish. By methods, we have get, post, put, and delete. If we're trying to gather information from the device that we're querying, that's a get. We're trying to get information from it. If we're trying to place an update or add a new device or add new information into a system, That'll be a put or a post. We're sending information up towards the solution. And when the time comes to delete something, we have the delete method so that we can remove elements from the piece. And we package up the requests in those formats. JSON and XML are the, the language that's used to actually translate the data back. When we work in a traditional mechanism on a switch or a router, what we see is we see text-based output that comes, and that was designed specifically for human readability. It's an output so that somebody looks at the screen and we can interpret it easily. What that output is not good for is for any kind of automation or programmability. You end up having to build these gigantic screen scraping regexes and you pray that when the next version of code comes out, the developer hasn't added like an extra space which breaks all of your program, uh, your, your scripting and your automation. By using machine language friendly formats like JSON and XML, you know that every time you make these queries, you're going to get it back in a very structured format. 
So it may not be as easy for the human to read, but as we bring these into solutions where we're trying to string together automation, we're trying to gather data across hundreds or thousands of devices, we can be confident that our consistency will go through. Authentication, just because we're moving off of CLI or a traditional web interface doesn't mean that we don't want to make sure that only the properly authorized people take activities. The way we do authentication in most REST uh, protocols is either going to be through a cookie, so we inject a cookie the same way that we know who you are when you're browsing the web or you're, you're going through and you're shopping on Amazon, or we use headers. By a header is when inside the REST request we inject a special bit of data that says this is who we are, please treat us like this information. So when we look at the authentication header that we use in UCS Director, what I tell people is treat that random string of numbers and letters the same as you treat your passwords. Because in effect, all of these authentication mechanisms is a combination of username and password all in one. We have to protect those. Because if you give access to your username and password, people can get in and take actions on, on your behalf. If they get access to your authentication information, the same thing will happen. The format of the process in arrest is that you have some client, it's either you or it's a Python script or it's some other element in the solution, and it will make a request of the REST service. The request service will then send back a response, and it's always this constant request response framework is where it goes through. So in the example on the screen, I have an end user making a request of a switch or a router using the API that's available inside of the iOS X or iOS XE family. And in this case, we're making a request. The format of, of the get request, we're trying to get information, is the URL, so API v1 routing service. And then we're requesting that they send us back JSON format. Most solutions, most APIs give you options. You can request JSON or XML, and it's purely up to the, uh, the designer, which one you're after. I personally prefer JSON. I find it easier to work with and read. The response that comes back is an actual HTTP response. The 200 OK at the top indicates that the web browser, the web server that you made the request of, retrieved the request, understood how to operate on it, and everything was OK and sends the data back. And then we get this, this information, and this is the JSON that actually provides the data that we requested. And we can see the AS number for EIGRP is embedded inside of that response information. So REST is just another way to get data out and work with our solution. If we look at making a REST request of UCS Director so that we can get data out of it, the format will be very similar to what we just saw through. Up at the top, I'm using curl as the most basic method to take advantage of the REST APIs. We'll look at other examples on how we can use the REST APIs in just a moment, but we start with the most basic. Curl exists on any Linux-based solution. I see several Macs in the room. Curl is something you can use to test web servers, check, check uh, status of a web host. It's a very common utility and all it does is builds out. So what we have here is I've got the header. Up here we see xcloudpia authentic or request key. That's the extra header I'm adding to the request to indicate that this is who I am so that I have the rights to make the request that I'm after. And then I have my long string of letters and numbers. And this is that username and password that I mentioned. So after posting this on the slide, I promptly went in and changed my authentication key so that I wasn't just broadcasting it on the side of a truck like it's my social security number. Following the authentication information, we get into the actual URL. The first bit in green is the actual end host, so that represents the UCS director instance that I'm targeting the request at. Following the .com, we get into the actual URL we're making the request of. So the, the access point is app, .ap, or app slash API slash rest. That's the URL we're going to. That's the equivalent of www.google.com slash search. Everything after the, the question mark are parameters being sent along with the request to indicate what we're trying to accomplish. So the first thing we'll see up here is we're, again, requesting JSON format. I'm fairly consistent with that. I find it much easier to work with. And then over here, we have the operation name. The operation name is the actual action I want to take. And what I'm asking for UCS Director to do is to send me back the information on all of the catalogs that are available to be ordered. This would be a great way as a developer to find out what's available for me to order to build my applications. Do I have web servers? Do I have application servers? Are there data servers? So what can I order? Down here in green is the actual request that gets sent out. These are typically hidden if you're browsing the web, but this is the actual format of what is sent out that is the HTTP protocol. So we can see it's a GET request. We can see the URL. 
and we can see all of the header information that's injected to make the request that goes through. Once the request makes it to the server, UCS Director will reply back with a response. The top of the screen here in green is the actual, all the header information, the HTTP concept so that the browser, when you get that information back, knows that it was valid. We see the 200 OK. We see that there was a cookie set that we have, so we have some se uh, session tracking between the requests. Down at the bottom in blue is the actual JSON request or information that's coming back. I truncated it here because it would have been much longer, but we can start to see all of the information about the catalogs that are available to be ordered. With this type of a model, I could then follow this with placing an order for a catalog or getting more details on something. As I mentioned, curl is not really the best way to work with REST queries. It's, it's touchy, you have to type it just perfectly. Most browsers have extensions that make it easier to test and work with them. This is an example of Postman. It's an extension for Google Chrome. I like this one because I can set up libraries and dictionaries and collections of different REST requests that I want to demo or test. And it gives me a format where I don't have to remember what are the flags to inject a new header? How do I get the parameters just right? It has, it's laid out in such a way that it makes that much easier to do for us. Another method to make the REST request, and this is actually how most application owners and developers that are using cloud-based platforms are doing it, is through a programming language like Python. So here's an example of how we can use Python with those same types of REST requests to pull down and get information. Inside of Python, they have modules that make life much, much easier. The first module I use is the request module, which actually ex uh, abstracts all of the delicacies that you have to do to to set up a socket, make the HTTP request, get the authentication done just pr properly. So we use the request module to give that capability. We'll talk in a moment about the arg parse module that I use to build some command line utilities in Python to make it even easier to work with some of these API calls that are out there. So Python, is a, as a language, it's very easy to get started. There are so many examples on how to do common activities on the internet, on developer.cisco.com, inside the communities. Most of the time, if you're building scripts or you're developing, you don't have to invent everything from, the, uh, from scratch. Find good examples and just build from there. To get started with using the REST API inside of UCS Director, the first thing you want to do is go into UCS Director and enable the developer menu. This gives you a real quick start on how to get access to what are the API calls, what are the formats, what data needs to be sent and, and consumed. The other thing you'll find in your profile is your actual access key. So that's that username and password that we'll use when we make the REST requests that go through there. Gives you an easy button to copy it so that you can copy it to a clipboard and start putting it into either Postman to do testing, put it into a variable inside of a Python script, and then if you need to change it because you're showing everybody your password up on a screen at Cisco Live, you can very easily hit regenerate key and get yourself a new passcode. Once you get inside and you've turned on the developer menu, underneath policies and orchestration inside of UCS Director, you'll find the REST API library, which is a searchable library of the hundreds of APIs available. They're organized by folder. What I tell people is when you get to the amount of APIs or the amount of out-of-the-box capability in a tool, trying to find what you're looking at in the folder is impossible. So use the search capability. Enter your search term, a few letters of what you're after, and it will filter down automatically and show you the requisite APIs that are available. Once you find the one you're after, double click on it and it will give you even more detail. Once we double click on it, the REST API, <coughs> excuse me, the REST API browser pops up and you can generate a URL and it'll show you the exact URL required to execute that command that you're after. When it fills up uh, initially, it'll have just sample inserted for all of the data that would be required to make that execution. So the one thing you do have to do is go in and fill in legitimate data if you're going to execute this request. I don't have a group in my system called sample, so I had to put in an actual group name to make this test. With it built, I can just hit execute REST API, and it will execute the API against the system, and I can verify that the formatting looked correct. I'll see what type of data that I get back. And it's a great way just to get started, make sure that you found the API that you're after. If you're trying to get information out or take an action, this is a great way to make sure that you have the right API before you go and you start building a gigantic Python script or programming language uh, interface to try to get the data out. So use the tools that are embedded here. So now that we've gone through that, let's go through some examples of how we could use the UCS Director API to take common actions. So the first action we'll look at, oh, before I do that, 
Inside of the Enterprise Cloud Suite from Cisco, UCS Director provides the infrastructure automation and management layer. So what we're talking about here is the UCS Director piece. The, all the API information I'm covering today is also valid for InterCloud Fabric for Business. They're, bit, they're built upon the same foundation. So the methods of interacting, the format, what you're capable of doing, I'm showing UCS Director here, but they work in InterCloud Fabric as well. And then on top of those two solutions is Prime Service Catalog, which has its own REST API that you can use as well. Okay. So our example that we're going to go through is I want to bulk order VMs. Yes. I can't hear you. Hold on. UCS is hard hardware. It. Yes. So we can get uh, data from how many devices? Like we have a big network, suppose 25,000 network devices. So it can interact with all those devices, one UCS device, or for per device we need one mm -hmm. UCS. So UCS Director is an infrastructure management automation platform that covers compute, network storage, virtualization. And it, in a single UCS Director instance can connect to hundreds of different network elements or server elements or storage elements and combine a single place to gather that data and query back. Make sense? And it can support the existing iOS devices, whatever we have in the network, or? Uh... Saying whatever you have in the network is a little bit too bold, but probably, there's a lot that it can support. It supports NXOS from a network perspective, it supports iOS devices, mm -hmm. supports some of the security appliances like the ASA platform from Cisco, as well as third party. We have support for F5 capabilities, brocade switches, there, it's a multi-vendor solution from Cisco. So it depends on how many logs you are uh, uh, getting from the devices, right? Not the number of devices in the network or it depends on the number of device, uh, devices you interact with the UCS. Yeah. So what UCS Director is able to do is to connect in the devices and give the ability to monitor and take actions. Um, let me finish up here on what, how we're using the APIs, and if you want to go deeper in it, I'll stick around after the session. Okay. Yep. Okay. So we're going to do a bulk order. Without it, using APIs, the, the main mechanism that we would do to take this type of an action to go order three, five, ten VMs is I would log into the web interface as a user, and I would double click every time I wanted to order a VM. And that gets old really fast. After about the third one, I'm, I'm tired of double clicking, and I don't know about you guys. But by using the API, I can do it very quickly in this programmatic fashion by diving in. So I need to find the right API. So using the REST API browser, I'll go find the VMware provision VM API call. I'll find the format that I'm after, the parameters that are required. What do you want to name the VM? What type of catalog are we going to order? which VDC construct inside of UCS Director will we deploy it to. And that gives me the ability to frame up what is the overall format of what we're after. Once I have the API formatted correctly, I can then go in and start building out the Python code to build through it. So what I want to achieve is I want to be able to create a loop where I'm ordering multiple, v or multiple new VMs based on different catalogs. In this example, I'm going to order three new virtual machines in a single script. I'll order a new web server, an application server, and a data server. If you've sat through any of the Python classes, you have any experience, this should look fairly straightforward. It's a standard list object where I have the three elements, one for each of the servers. I move over here where I create the URL format based on what I pulled out of the UCS director information. And then I just use a common for loop for every server in my server's list, go ahead and execute a request call so that I can go and place that service request. The output of this print.r text, and r.txt is the actual web page that would have been returned, or the data. Here it's going to be the JSON information that went through. The printout of this would be the service request number for each of the new ones that was built. With the service request numbers, I can then go find out information about the new VMs that I ordered. So here, it's another Python script. I have my list of service request numbers that were created. And then using that, and then the, the get VMs for service request API call, I can quickly populate and then pull out all of the new virtual machines that I, played, that, ordered, that I ordered when I executed that API call. And I haven't had to go in or log into the interface. I didn't have to double click. The details that come back include the host names, IP address information. You can do further queries if you need usernames and passwords from the system. Lots of information can be pulled through to get all of that, de that detail and data. So that's how you can use REST APIs natively if you're going to go after it. And it's fantastic. And I've been using them for a long time to manage my lab. But I found over uh, after doing several demos and restanding up and building out my lab that I got a little bit tired of trying to natively go in and double click or go through and just use the native REST API calls. Because that's handy, but they're not exactly super user friendly. 
So what I started out as a weekend project to manage my own lab turned into a, a, a GitHub repository out there with different libraries to help interface with Cisco's cloud solutions. It's open, feel free to grab it, download them. You can use any of these examples that go through. But what, what I built is I built a library for UCS directors so that I can I wrap up the REST API calls into very simple functions in Python, as well as command line utilities to take the actions that we're after. I have a similar library for InterCloud Fabric Director, so I can manage both private and hybrid cloud utilities. Python is super user friendly. This has made the management of my own lab so much easier that I've actually I started working this into all the proof of concepts and demos that I give with customers, and then I published it here on GitHub. One of my coworkers at Cisco actually pulled it down, found a bug, fixed the bug for me, and pushed it back up. This is the power of being in the developer community and using these types of resources. I've now got multiple people going through, and I would love to see customers download, connect, and then add additional capability. That's part of the developer community and part of what Cisco's trying to do and foster between our customers, our partners, and Cisco itself. So let's take a demo of what this looks like. So what we're going to take a look at is a way to work with UCS Director from a pure command line interface. I'm never going to open up the web, the web page for this. The first thing I have to do as a developer is figure out what VDCs do I have access to? Where can I actually provision resources? So what I see here is I used a command line utility that's part of that Cisco cloud library that we went through, and it's pushing out and showing me all of the VDCs that are available. The next step I want to know is what virtual machines exist in those VDCs that I can work with. So I, for, I use another command line utility, the VM list utility, to find out all the VMs that are there. You'll see here I'm taking advantage of dash K and dash V flags in the utility. That allows me to filter down based on a key value pair. So search the VDC that equals this VDC name. Following this, we'll see dash F flags, which indicate I only want to get certain data back. Don't give me all of the JSON information. I only want a little bit of it. So with each of the dash Fs, I can filter down what I see. Now I see all the virtual machines that were in that VDC, and I know that I'm going to need more. In order to order new VMs, I need to know the catalogs available, so I take advantage of the catalog list utility that's there. The dash G flag is I'm filtering and saying, my group name is cloud users, so show me the catalogs I can order on behalf of my, myself. We'll see we're taking advantage here as well of the KV flags. I only want to search for standard catalogs. Those are VM orders. Gives me those ability. This then goes through and shows all the catalogs that met my requirement, and now I'm ready that I can actually start placing orders. What I switch to here is actually into Python. So once I want to go through and start doing bulk orders of VMs, the utilities may not be the best way. So we'll go native Python for this, and we'll see that I import in the UCS director library, and then I import pprint, which is just a pretty way to print out data rather than just a standard format. The next thing I'll do is I'll build out all of the variables that I need to place the order. So what VDC am I going to order? What, different, or, uh, what VDC am I going to place my VMs into? What catalogs am I going to order? What group am I a member of so that when I order the VMs, they get assigned to the proper group? So we enter all that data here. Using that information, I can then build out that list object so that I can make my bulk order. It's a, always a good habit when you're working in Python to make a note of what your format is targeting so I can see the catalog, VDC, and comment is what I'm going to build up inside of this list structure. We'll go ahead and I'll create the three different VMs that I'm going to order by using the variables that were used above. What I will do is as I loop through all of these elements inside of the list, I'll inject into the catalog order function so that I get the VMs that I'm after. So I see my three different VMs I'm going to order. Now, to place a catalog order, there's a catalog order function, but I don't know what the format is. So we use the help capability built into Python, as well as the notation that I provided, so that we see everything that needs to be used to place an order using this function. I create a couple of empty lists so that as I place my order and I get my new VMs, I can put them into an object that I can control. And now I'll start looping through. So we can see four server in servers. It's the list we created. Go ahead and make a new request and append that to the orders information that we're going to go through. So orders.append, catalog order, and then I'm filling in the data that I provided as part of the list and as part of my variables. This will go through, and now I have all of these orders available. So let's take a look at the service requests that were generated based on this. So I loop over the orders that, was, that were appended based on all of those pieces, and I'm just going to print out the service request number so that I know what service requests that I get. 
See, I have three new service requests, one for each VM that I ordered. Using that service request information, I can then go out and query to get all the new VMs that are available so that I have that access. So I'm gonna go ahead and append into the, uh, the new VMs list all of the VM information that comes back from the service request VMs function that goes through. So I take the service request number from the first call and then use that for a second call. I'm not perfect, I made a typo. We'll copy and paste, we'll get by it. I tried to figure out a way to edit that through but it would have messed up the whole flow, so. So here, now I can see what new virtual machines did I order for with this system. You can see all of my new virtual machines, where their current status is, and at this point, I've gotten to the end of the day, it's five o'clock and it's time to go home, and I wanna shut off all my new VMs so that I can go through and I'm not burning resources overnight. So I'll do one final loop where I'll loop over all of those new VMs that were created and use the VM power off function to go ahead and just turn off all my VMs, so I'll be done for the day. We'll see here I use the function and it shoots out all of the new service requests that were generated to do that action for me. As a developer, as an application consumer, as a cloud consumer, this is the type of mechanism that many people are trying to interact with the cloud over. If you've got, if you've got people in your enterprise that are using AWS or Azure, likely this is how they're acting with those. What we've done with Enterprise Cloud Suite from Cisco is by having these APIs, your developers can continue to use this type of methodology. We don't have to force them back into the, the, the web interface. So we don't have to force them to change their process they can use our APIs to have those same types of actions. Okay. We'll flip back. That's all I had. It was just a quick example of showing how we can use the APIs as we go through on this. Uh, hopefully it gave, opened up your eyes a little bit what the possibilities are. I'll stick around for a little bit if anyone has any questions and we can cover yours if you have. Thanks very much for coming today and enjoy the rest of your final day here at Cisco Live and safe travels back home.